Now with our legs all cut out, everything's looking pretty good. The next step is going to be to shape everything, to make it nice and round and smooth, uh, make it just a really nice organic form. So uh, the way that I like to do that is to start out at the router table. I've got a lot of material here to remove if we're going to round these corners over all the way across this shape. Um, you know, that's a lot of hand rasp work to do and uh, I don't really want to do all that work. So um, I'm going to get the bulk of the material off of there with a one inch radius round over bit. Okay, so it's a lot of routing, but it'll be well worth it in the time savings because what we're going to end up with is something that looks more like this. Okay, so it's sort of the rough rounded over edge. Now we've got a lot of sharp points here you know, where the round over stops, and, and I don't want that. I want it to be nice and smooth all the way around. So this will get us pretty close to where we want to be, and the rest we'll do, uh, you know, we'll use hand tools, maybe some sanders, basically whatever I can get my hands on to make the shape exactly what I want it to look like. So uh, let's head on over to the router table. This process is similar to the flush trimming exercise. Use an index pin and push pads. Also, keep in mind that the larger bits like this do require you to run the router at a lower speed. Consult the manufacturer's specifications for exact numbers. Now it's time for the hand shaping. And my favorite tool for this task is going to be a number 49 Nicholson's uh, Cabinet Maker's Rasp. It's this guy right here. Okay, this thing cuts fast, it can cut aggressive, it can cut smooth. It kind of reminds me of a lathe tool, uh, you know, where, where you could sort of turn it one way or the other and get either an aggressive cut or a very light cut. So the more you work with the tool, the more you get to know it and the more effective you're going to be. So what I want to do is primarily smooth the back end and the inside edge of the leg here. I'm really going to leave this part alone because this is where it's going to join up to the centerpiece and I'm not really 100% sure how I'm going to resolve all that just yet. Uh, but I want to get the, the bulk of this done while I have the legs separated from each other and, and individually. Um, so we'll start with the rasp, move on to, well, I guess anything that excites me from that point. I think I'll probably at some point be moving to a five inch random orbit sander, but let's start with the rasp and see where it takes us. Okay, the first thing that I'm going to hit is the sharp corner here. We have our nice flat edge, which is what we needed to do the routing, but I really want to blend it so it's a little bit more of a natural curve from the round over to the other round over. Uh, so the key here is really keeping it consistent, not working one area too much before you move on to the next section so that when it's all said and done, it's, it's all pretty even. If I really worked hard over here, got it to the point that it was perfect, um, exactly where I want it, and then tried to continue and move down, you might go too far, you know? So if I'm gonna basically hit this corner here, hit that edge at a 45 degree angle, that's as far as I'm gonna go before I move on to the rest of it, right? Because I want to make sure I work every spot an even amount. And even if it's not exact, at least it's pretty darn close because I physically haven't worked one area more than another, okay? But I will do my best to try and keep that angle consistent uh, as I start, start to round it over. So I usually start by making what would be like a chamfer on that corner, that 45 degree cut, all the way. Okay, now if you think about it, now I have basically a straight edge here, all the way across that edge. So what I want to do is now soften the other two corners that I've just created. I created a new one here and a new one here. So I want to do the same thing, but a lot faster going back and forth here. So I'm going to do the one closest to me. And the one closest to you. So in effect now, in a very rough sort of way, that's right, I didn't need that, uh, I've just rounded that over, okay? So we're gonna do that, but to a much more thorough degree over the entire piece. That was just a small amount. Uh, so let's go ahead and continue with it. I'm gonna shut up and start working here.
Now, I don't, I won't pretend that any of this is official. I just kind of made it up as I went along what seems to feel natural as I work with this tool. There may be other great techniques out there that I'm not even aware of, but this is what works for me. So as I go through, I like to really round it over. So as I'm pushing forward, follow the curve. And that gives me a much more consistent round over along that edge. So, that's pretty good. It's probably as far as I'm going to take it right now. Uh, like I said, we're going to work on this area later, but it's looking like a much more round form instead of the sort of blocky edge that we had before. So, that's good enough for now. Take it out of the vise and start all over again. So now the shape of our leg is established. We did all the work we needed to do with our rasp. And we're left with a, uh, a semi-rough surface. I mean, this, is, this rasp does a really good job of uh, producing a relatively smooth surface for a file, for a rasp. Um, but not smooth enough. We need to go a step further. And I did want to take a minute to talk about this particular step. In a lot of cases, you know, I talk to woodworkers constantly who hate finishing. That it's just something that they don't enjoy doing. They'd rather just finish the project, pass it off to somebody, let them finish it, uh, and call it a day. But unfortunately, the reality of it is the fact that the finish is almost as important, sometimes more important, than the workmanship that got you there in the first place. Because, you know, you put a crappy finish on a piece like this, people will notice, you know. So the wood itself has to be prepped properly. You have to have it nice and smoothly sanded, consistently sanded. So you should be spending a decent amount of time getting all of those little scratches out, getting this... Uh, surface as perfect as possible so that when someone comes up to this piece and they grab it and feel it and touch it because that's what they're going to do, especially on something like this that isn't typical. It's not something you would normally see in most average furniture stores. So the average person goes, whoa, that's neat. You know, they don't really, uh, they've never really seen anything like that made out of wood. So you have to be prepared for that and having a really nice smooth finish is the way to get there and it all starts right here with the sanding process. So the process that I use is a little bit more systematic uh, than what you know, maybe some people would use. It's gonna start with rough sanding using the random orbit sander, usually about 80 grit. Then I'm gonna move on to some other things to smooth it out from there. And I'll show you the process as we go along. Now the first step is gonna be to use my random orbit sander. I have 80 grit on here. And I'm gonna go over the entire surface. Now it's not exactly what you think. I'm not doing this to really smooth everything out at this point. I don't want to use my sander for that. That's, um, I don't feel like I have as much control. I feel like I could create more problems than I'm solving if I go too heavily with the sander right now, especially with 80 grit. So I'll quickly go over the whole surface as a preparation step uh, for the next step, which is using my card scrapers to smooth it out. And the card scraper, on the other hand, I have a lot of control with, and I could really pull off a lot of material where I need to to keep things nice and smooth. So what this is going to do, believe it or not, is sort of just going to give me a frame of reference. As I sand the whole surface, it's going to create a nice fine powder that's going to put a white haze over the entire piece. And then when I come back with my scraper, every stroke of the scraper all of a sudden becomes very visible when there's an issue. It sort of magnifies any problems that are in the wood. Uh, and you'll know within two to three strokes of the scraper whether or not you've You've uh, gotten the surface nice and smooth from that point. So um, let's hit it with the sander. All right, and now that the surface is kind of powdery, it's time to go to the scrapers and do the real smoothing. So I've got an assortment of scrapers here ready to go. In case one gets dull as I'm working with it. And uh, let's take a, a nice close look and hopefully I can get the camera angle just right so you can see exactly what I'm talking about here.
and I could really start to see where there's flaws and rework those areas a little bit to smooth them out more. This area actually looks pretty good. Now what's really cool about this method is you're sort of getting two things out of this. You're getting a visual reference for areas that you've worked versus areas that you haven't worked. Which in a leg like this can get pretty confusing. It's hard to know where you've, what areas you've worked and what areas you haven't. But as I go through, like I said, I'm exposing real problems. And the reason is this powder from the sanding will sit down deeper into areas where there are flaws. So as you scrape, you smooth it out, you see the darker color, the more um, vivid color of the wood come through, and anything that still has that hazy look to it is filled with sawdust, which means it's sitting lower and therefore has to be worked a little bit more. Here's a spot right there that I gotta do. And that's really it. And you can see a problem area here and here. Much better. All right, so it's not a perfect world. Poopy happens. And you see this little flaw here? It's a little divot. Now, I don't know that my scraping is going to remove enough material to get rid of this. So, I'm going to do my best fix, and hopefully we'll even wind up removing most of this that I'm putting on here now. I'm just adding some CA glue to the surface. Put on a little dab of, uh, that's medium CA glue. Give it a little spray of quick activator. And that's going to harden. Now at this point, this is sort of just a precautionary measure. I may get rid of this entire spot with my scraping, but just in case, I wanted that glue in there ahead of time. So by the time I get down as far as I want to go, uh, the surface is exactly the way that I want it with the repair already in place. If I scrape it down first and realize, oh boy, you know, there's a little spot that I need to fill, that's not the time that you want to fill it because then that glue seeps in and soaks into the wood around it like it has here. So if we do it ahead of time, we'll get rid of most of that stuff and only be left with that little tiny repair area. So let's scrape it down and see where it takes us. Now, I'm not done scraping, but I think we're probably going to be able to get rid of most of this material here. So I wanted to stop and show you what things would look like if this were the end of the repair and you stopped right here. Okay, here's a little bit of water. Okay, that simulates what the finish might do, and you notice it's nearly invisible at this point. You still have a little tiny mark there, but nothing like what you would have seen if we would have just left that hole in that location. Now, the scraping is done, and for some people, yeah, they might stop at this point. Uh, a, a scraped surface, you know, in, in some people's opinions, is much better than a sanded surface. Uh, my scrapers were said to be a little bit more aggressive than that, and I'm, I don't know, I've never really been fond of uh, stopping with a scraped surface. I do like to proceed with the sanding portion. So at this point, I'm going to jump to, I would say, about 120 grit. Now, you might be tempted to jump on your sander, okay, and bring your sander in here and start uh, working it that way. And I'll tell you why I don't like that. So as you're going back and forth, even if you try and go this way, it's a little bit hard on this piece. If it was you know, a nice straight spindle. You can use this technique to round things over. But in this case, we're going with the grain. And what we're actually doing is creating a series of flats, okay, as we go through, because we can't contour to that shape. It's just not going to happen. So instead of doing that, it's going to be a little bit tedious. It's going to take a lot of work, probably a good 10 to 15 minutes per leg. But I really think it's worth it in the end. I'm going to start with 120 grit paper, and I'm going to basically sand everything by hand. Okay, now your fingers will follow the contours as you go through and really give you a nice, smooth, blended shape 
that you really can't get with, with a power sander. I mean, I guess you could if you're really good, but I've never really had that much luck with it. So I'm gonna go through the whole process with 120 and then jump up to 180 and that's it. And this leg is ready for finish. Um, obviously we're not ready to finish it because we've got to glue everything together, but uh, I wanted to finish this outside of the portion now before gluing everything together because, uh, you know, once I've got them all connected to that centerpiece, it's going to be a little difficult to, uh, to secure everything. So now this way I can put everything in the clamp. So here we go. All right, with our legs sanded, I think it's time that we can start to glue this whole thing together and really see what's going to happen, how the whole thing is going to look. Now I'm going to start by gluing two sides together, two opposing uh, legs together uh, first and then kind of see where we're at. I don't want to put everything together completely because again, I'm, I'm sort of doing this on the fly. So I may make last minute changes, last minute adjustments as I go. And being able to see things come together uh, slowly is really the way to do that. Plus the clamping would get a little bit hairy if I'm doing both sides at the same time. So uh, I'll do basically what I have numbered as one and three. A Little bit of glue into the dovetail slot first. Okay, some glue on the dovetail. All right, here we go. Number three. Goes in number three. Slide that guy up in there. You can see how quickly that starts to uh, swell and become a problem. So. Time is of the essence. Maybe another good reason not to do all four at the same time. There we go. Clamping time. It's an irregular surface, so this is not going to be perfect. This guy is nice and straight, so the clamp up here is really just to provide some counter pressure because the location of my set of clamps here right along the joint is going to be a little bit low from the center point. It's also a curved surface. So I'm using a little bit of cloth here. It's from an old t-shirt. That's going to help it conform to that shape and decrease the chance of denting. Okay, so let me tighten this guy down. Okay, now I'm going to throw this clamp right across here just to give me a little bit of extra security that everything is seated as far as it's going to go. Tighten down this guy. If there is any gaps, that will close them up. And then this guy is going to provide just a little bit of counter pressure at the top. Not much. And once this is tight, that guy can go away. And this, my friends, is very exciting because this is our first glimpse into what this piece is going to look like. Cool. Now it's time to glue on the other two legs. Now I've got all four legs in here. The two ones are still, the glue is still wet, so I have an opportunity to make any last minute changes. And what I'm noticing is there's a little bit of unevenness there, okay? My workbench is pretty much dead flat and I got a little wobble. Now the bottom, I could always fix that later. That's really not a problem, but I'm really most concerned with the top because the top is where, you know, these top surfaces were gonna route out a little groove and that's where the top is going to nest into and sit into. So if that's uneven, that's going to look really funny. So again, I'll adjust the feet later. I'm really worried about the top at this point. So wherever I feel I need to move these either up or down just a hair, it's not going to make a difference in the final look or the security of the joint. I'm just going to give it a tap or two until it stops moving completely. And then I know that the top is all in the same plane. And it's really not far off, so we're not, I'm not making major adjustments here. This is very minor stuff at this point, but it will save me a lot of work later. Okay, and again, I'm going to add a clamp across the joint. And since 
we're in a little bit of an awkward position here. I'm taping on my little guards. Now while the final glue up is drying, kind of gives us an opportunity to think a little bit about the top. Now again, you know, a lot of people may not agree with the method of designing on the fly like this, but there are just some questions that I can't answer until I have a real piece of material in front of me that I can make a decision on. And I'm not trying to win any awards here. I'm not trying to make a million dollars off of this piece. I just want to build a cool looking piece of furniture. It's really that simple. So at this stage, I now have to ask myself, what do I want to do with the top? Now initially I was looking for an all wood solution. I was thinking some sort of a panel with a nice banding around the outside. It would have to be ply if I'm going to uh, secure it to these legs. We don't want solid wood because it might, you know, blow out. So as I got to thinking about it a little bit more, the top of this is going to feature four dovetails right at that juncture in the middle and that's going to look really cool. I really think it would be a shame to lose that to hide it with a panel. So, I mean, I guess you can kind of see if you, you know, look underneath. I just don't know that that's the, um, the effect that I want. I'd like to show off the joinery in this case. And as much as I don't want glass in my house, I'm thinking for the sake of this piece to make this look as good as it can look, I'm thinking glass is going to be the way to go. So, uh, I've contacted a local custom glass uh, cutting company, I guess, and um, I'm pricing out probably some 3 8 inch material and you know something with a nice edge to it and it's going to I'm going to have to make a template and have them custom cut it to size so that will probably be what we talk about and do next week uh, is decide how we're actually going to handle that top but um, given the general shape that you see here obviously it's upside down right now the uh, the top itself is going to rest into a, some routed recesses that are going to be in the top portion of the legs so I'd be curious what you guys think uh, as to the design of the piece and, and what you would do for the top. To me, it's a very, you know, the legs are very weighty, you know, and I think if you put a, a heavy, visually heavy top on it, I think it just becomes too much. And I think it's nice to give it that airy look so you could really appreciate the structure. Um, but I really would be curious to hear uh, your opinions too, so feel free to email me or uh, put a uh, response in the comment section.